Okay, so today we want to uh, spend a few minutes here uh, going over what you did with the Gospel of Wealth reading. Um, so <clears throat> we're just going to use my screen here. I'm not going to hit every single thing, but I do want to cover some of the most important things and make sure that you have a, a good understanding of it. So whatever you've put down for your answers in your notes is fine. I'm guessing that some of what you put down is not going to be uh, completely accurate or maybe, you know, there'll be a couple things maybe you didn't fully understand, but we're going to go through those. You can make changes and adjustments. In the end, we just want to make sure that we understand the basic philosophies that Carnegie was talking about. So let's start with number one. It says, explain what Carnegie means in lines one and two of the reading. So if I go up here and we look at uh, the first two lines, it says, this then is held to be the duty of the man of wealth. First, to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display or extravagance to provide moderately for the legitimate wants of those dependent upon him. Okay, what do you think that means? Well, here's a good word to start with big word for the day unostentatious uh, you probably you probably are more familiar with uh, the the term modest and what that probably means um, so ultimately what Andrew Carnegie is saying here is that you shouldn't live how even if you are rich you shouldn't live an extravagant there he is we should shun extravagance you shouldn't be real showy and flaunting your money you should live a modest unostentatious living um, now I find there's a little bit of irony here because I'm just going to ask you what do you think do you think that Andrew Carnegie lived modestly and unostentatiously or do you think that he lived uh, a bit of an extravagant life remember he was the richest man in the world at one point in his life um, so there's a little bit of irony here because uh, I can just give you this example Carnegie owned at least one if not multiple castles in Scotland uh, just as, you know, an extra place to travel whenever he wanted to go to Scotland and he would live in his castle. So I don't think that's uh, very unostentatious or modest, but I do appreciate the sentiment. He believed that even if you're w wealthy, you shouldn't really flaunt it. Um, so that's what he's saying there in lines one and two. Uh, number two says, explain what Carnegie means in lines eight, nine, and ten. So let's see what he says here in lines eight, nine, and ten. He says... Uh, those who would administer wisely must indeed be wise, for one of the serious obstacles to the improvement of our race is indiscriminate charity. It were better for mankind that the millions of the rich were thrown into the sea than so spent as to encourage the slothful, the drunken, the unworthy. Now, what do you think he means there? Well, um, he, he says that one of the serious obstacles to the improvement of our race, to the betterment of society, is indiscriminate charity. What do you think he means by indiscriminate charity? What does that mean? That would be uh, the difference between, well, we'll wait on that for a second. Indiscriminate charity would simply be the idea of handing out money to somebody. That would be a good example of indiscriminate charity. Uh, so if you see somebody begging on the street and you give them a dollar. Andrew Carnegie would refer to that as indiscriminate charity. How does he feel about that in these lines, 8, 9, and 10? What is he saying about that? He's saying that that is the worst thing that we can do. Now, remember, this is his philosophy, not mine, uh, but we want to learn where he's coming from. He's saying that all that does is encourage negative things like laziness, drunkenness, and encouraging the unworthy poor people that don't deserve to have that indiscriminate charity. So he's not a big fan of, uh, if he were walking through uh, a big city and he saw a beggar on a, on a corner, I don't think uh, Andrew Carnegie's going to be taking money out of his wallet and giving it to that beggar. So there's another side to it, though, because we know that he becomes one of the greatest philanthropists and, and gives donates more to charity than maybe anyone in, in history, right? So uh, we got to continue through his philosophy here, through his gospel of wealth, to learn a little bit more. Um, how would you, uh, just number three says, how would you describe Andrew Carnegie's attitude towards the poor? Well, I think in lines eight, nine, and 10, uh, we get a little bit uh, of, of his feelings. Who do you think Andrew Carnegie felt uh, is to blame for somebody who's poor? Whose fault is it that you're poor? According to Andrew Carnegie, what do you think? Well, I don't know the answer because I've never sat down with him, but based on his philosophy on, uh, on many levels, Andrew Carnegie probably believed that if you're poor, it's your own fault and that you could have done something or can do something to change that. 
And there's probably some merit to that philosophy, but there's probably also some some factors that that, that might want to be you might want to consider before you make a, a broad statement like that. So um, that's just a little bit about uh, you know where he where he was when he viewed people who were poor. Where did he start as a poor immigrant, right? And look what he was able to do with himself. So that was a lot of you know what drove his philosophy, and that gets us to number four. How would you uh, describe Carnegie's feelings about charity? And so this is where we get from that idea of indiscriminate charity, just handing out something to somebody who's poor versus the, the way that he thought you should do it. So I'm actually going to skip down to number five. Because I think in number, uh, in number five, in line 24, you're going to start to see, hopefully you started to see this as you read it yourself, his philosophy and view of how charity should work. So it says in line 24, Carnegie uses the word ladders. What is he referring to? So if we go up to line 24 here... Uh, he says, uh, um, others who know that the best means of benefiting the community is to place within its reach the ladders upon which the aspiring can rise. Parks and means of recreation by which men are helped in body and mind, works of art, certain to give pleasure and improve the public taste and public institutions of various kinds which will improve the general condition of the people. He believes that you should create or uh, place within the, the reach of poor people ladders. So what do you think he means by that? Think about the, the literal sense of a ladder. What do you do on a ladder? You step on the bottom rung and you use it to move your way up the ladder to get to the top, right? So um, Andrew Carnegie's view of charity and how it should, um, should, what it should look like is that rather than giving indiscriminate handouts to people that are poor, handing money to somebody to try to, you know, change their situation, you should provide opportunities, ladders. You should provide what was the one thing that he built more than anything with his, uh, with his charity money, libraries is a good example. He felt like if I build a library uh, and provide an opportunity for someone to get knowledge and information and education, that's much better than just handing them uh, uh, money on the street. So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about ladders. And we know that he built museums. He built, uh, he funded works of art. He built parks in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, there's there's uh, multiple parks uh, for, for people to get outside and, and do physical exercise, that kind of stuff. He believed that all of that was a much better way to spend his charitable f uh, uh, dollars than simply to hand out money to somebody. Okay. Um, then we get down to number six. He says, according to, it says, according to Carnegie, what is the true gospel of wealth? And this is where he sort of sums it all up. And a lot of it is derived from what he's saying throughout. But if we go to these lines right here, it says, the man who dies, leaving behind many millions of available wealth, which was his to administer during his life, will pass away unwept, unhonored, and unsung. No matter to what uses he leaves the dross which he cannot take with him of such as these the public verdict will then be the man who dies rich dies disgraced such in my opinion is the true gospel of wealth obedience to which is destined someday to solve the problem of the rich or the poor and to bring peace on earth among good men, uh, goodwill among men so this is where he sums it all up the man he very famously said the man who dies rich dies disgraced. So in his idea, the, the true gospel of wealth is that uh, if you uh, spend your time in your life making money, you should also set aside time to give that money back in some way, shape, or form. Not, again, in the, the idea of indiscriminate just handouts to people, but instead by providing the ladders for members of a community to, uh, to improve their situation and get out of poverty uh, with those ladders. And it, nobody exemplified this idea of dying rich and disgraced than Andrew Carnegie. He made sure that he did not die rich. He was the richest man in the world, but when he was gone, uh, he had made sure already before he was gone that every, almost it was like 90% of his entire fortune was already designated to be donated to all these different things that, um, that he wanted to put out there, not just in the Pittsburgh community, all over the country, really. So there you have a little bit about uh, Andrew Carnegie's philosophy about making money, about charity, about giving back to the community, about philanthropy. So the final question is really, 
you know, less about you know, me explaining it uh, and more about you just thinking about those, those ideas. It says, do you agree or disagree with his philosophies? Um, I'm going to leave you with your own thoughts on that one to think about, uh, and hopefully you wrote some things down in your notes, uh, you know, explaining your response to that question. Remind me in class, I want to tell you a story of an experience that I had that sort of answers number seven from my perspective, whether or not I agree with Andrew Carnegie's philosophies. So you have that to look forward to.